And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged, albeit an emergency edition. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me as always is my good brother here in the temple, the man of a thousand runes, the CEO of Zadare Enterprises, and the bane of my fucking existence, good brother Xanatrix. You know what they say, a bane a day keeps anxiety at bay. That one died midway through you saying it. <laughs> it's also supposed to be sarcastic, so that works. So, as I said, this is a emergency edition of Valley of the Judged. I did not plan to do to do an episode this early or on a Wednesday instead of our usual Friday recording days. But let's just say let's just say that things happened that forced my hand. So, I think we should give I think we should give a bit of background. Oh. Some of you may, cast your mind back to about I don't know, six months ago, shall we say? Ish, yeah. Right around the time that everybody is dreading the release of Netflix Bebop, which... I'm fine. <laughs> I'm fine. I'm fine. I end, up, I end up catching wind that a Cowboy Bebop TTRPG is going to be hitting the market. And I remember a certain asso former associate of ours being ex being excessively cynical and saying that this was made as n as nothing more than a tie-in to to that to that live action series. And it it wasn't just one person though he was the most vocal about it. There were a few people who were worried that it was going to be either a tie-in or a stretch of a the world's most ubiquitous TTR RPG system. And I was I was the odd man out in the, in this bunch because I was because I was poking holes in both claims. Because in the case of in the case of the former, if that was the case, why why is it that the press release that I got didn't have any assets from the from the live action stuff, it was all stuff from the anime. And B um Mono Pro the only thing the only link to that is Mono Project Studio. And that link is tenuous. Tenuous at best. And then you had me, the guy sitting there eating some popcorn going Man. I love watching Monk yell at people. It's not even my fault this time. <laughs> I yelled with you because it's funny. I yelled at them because they were being stupid. Mm-hmm. And while the, while there are while there are certain there are certain personalities that are perfectly fine with a black pill with a everything sucks black pill <clears throat> razor. <clears throat> I really need to take care of this cough. I am not one of them. Because for for me it for me it's a it was very clearly a case of a lot a lot of people needing that conclusion rather than it actually being present. So I don't need to give any intro, any diatribe on on what the hell Cowboy Bebop is. If you're if you have any bit of weeb DNA in your in your blood, you know you know what it is, and you and you know why that why that kind of setting is enough to carry an RPG. Um, I know that certain colleagues of ours say say that Outlaw Star would be a better pick for it. I argue, why can't we do both? I mean, there's there's a lot of stuff, not just Outlaw Star that could be done with with you know TTRPGs and such, mm -hmm. but yes, Outlaw Star is another good candidate. 
Yeah, it's I'm not going I don't consider it a better candidate because they're on two different energies. Yeah. It's a it's another candidate rather than a better one. Mhm. Mm and I know someone might say, "Yeah, but they're both you're both they're both space westerns. And didn't you do a whole thing on space westerns at the start of Geek Watch?" Yeah, we did. And the reason we focused on those three is that each of them has their own energy, but still having the DNA of a Western. Mm-hmm. Oh. But I do want I do want to make clear why I why I felt the way that I did regard regarding this. While Mana Project Studio is listed as is listed as publisher, um, the other major publisher is Don't Panic Games, who have a very good his have a very well well established history adapting anime into board games. They've done they've done so they've done so with Naruto, Attack on Titan, and Tokyo Ghoul, as well as one with Cowboy Bebop, which I do remember playing at. At a convention a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. But the actual the actual grunt work is handled by Fumble GDR, who are fr are friends of the show. Now for those who need a refresher, Fumble GDR um, won a won a best RPG award in their in their native Italy for the for their universalist leaning game, not the end. We've, some of you may also recall that I've co that I've covered a modified version of that when I had the developer of Knights of the Round Academy on to do an interview. Knights of the mm -hmm. Round Academy is essentially school drama meets mechs with a heavy amount of Arthurian influence. And you know how much we love Mecha. Mm -hmm. And... And one would one would think, oh, that's just an, that's just an isolated case. No, it it's really not because there's two other projects I know that are in the works that make that make it very clear that Fumble GDR were the right people to do this. One of them, which is currently still in Italian and will probably see will probably see an English translation in a year or so, is Login. Which is meant to be, which is meant to be their own little tribute to Dot Hack. Which is, of course, why as soon as you hear login, you think Dot Hack, because mm -hmm. you can log in. But you, in fact, <clears throat> you can log in any time you like, but you can never leave. Boo! <laughs> hey, it was a perfect opportunity. <laughs> <sighs> Regardless, the other project is Gatai, or rather Shin Gatai. See, Gatai was the first project that Fumble GDR ever did, a very rules light affair that was meant as a loving tribute to 70s era Super Robot. Including and appa apparently having rules that you that you had to shout out the name of your finishers. That's the best rule because <laughs> I would win. <laughs> you would you would also pr you would also probably pu pull a Morikawa in the process. <laughs> How many times has my mic gone out when we've tried when I've tried screaming stuff? I I should keep a tally. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but with the with that said, I a few days ago, one more in fact I think it was le I think it was last Thursday or so. I end up getting a I end up getting a a message from Mon, from Mana Project at all that about the playtest document for the Cowboy Bebop RPG. And I end up taking a look at it, and I decided 
you know what? I'm gonna choose violence because I, because I had suspected for months on end that since Fumble GDR has no track record using the world's most ubiquitous RPG, that they were gonna do something a little more in house, a little more up to their speed, probably using the Hexis system that they use for Not the End. As you're going to see, I was right. I, I think uh, his exact words. If I uh, if I review the the server for just one second, uh, was fuck you. I was right about ten times, more like six, but still. Yes. Now, granted, it ended up it ended up getting taken offline for a hot minute because of the drive through RPG hack, but that's been that's been settled and. Today, we are going to be looking at the contents of that playtest. Which, fortunately, it's fortunately it's not that lengthy of one. It's only 38 pages. And it's pretty. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, will, I will point that I... I very much like how they've, um, in, how they've integrated a lot of key art and episode art into the pages of course they of course they do that i mean this is it's very clear just from this play this uh play test document alone that this is a labor of love mm -hmm. so we will start we will start with what you will experience Actually, I, I do need to point out something on the actual opening cover page. Not the not the the title pages, but the first page where it says Cowboy Bebop, the role-playing game. Um, there is a part here that I feel is probably going to be expanded upon and or, and or should be integrated into the beginning of the What You Will Experience. Mm -hmm. All you need to play is called is a character sheet called a bounty hunter cluster and some d6s of two different colors and i feel that 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 needs to be addressed very first yeah um i should note that not the end doesn't use dice it uses tokens but it has a positive negative um setup mm -hmm. so the, this is obviously trying trying to do the token thing with the, with this game would be a bit of a stretch, but it is good it is good to know that we're just dealing with good old fashioned d6s. I personally would recommend um, black and white d6s, but it's very clear that they're gonna that you'll see later on. It's very clear that they want d6s of two different colors. To be a, a smart ass, I would use. Uh, maroon and burgundy. And anyone who has watched Cowboy Bebop will know exactly why I would use maroon and burgundy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, starting off with the what what will you experience with, with the world. The solar system of Cowboy Bebop is a multicultural frontier land. At the same time, reminiscent of some Western movies and San Francisco in the 70s, but it is also a solar system where bounty hunters move around using the gates after an accident destroyed the moon and forced humanity to almost completely abandon the Earth's surface. Bar, is that you? <laughs> we can see glimpses of Mars, Venus, Jupiter's moons, and the many space stations, but we will never have a complete view of what it means to inhabit this solar system in 2071. For this reason, storytellers have at their disposal a series of cues and tools, including specially made clusters to build and describe their own places. Questionable bars, glitzy casinos, red dragon buildings, ISSP stations. Mm. Which is a smart thing to do. You're not going to be able to get through the detail of every single station. And truth be told, I don't think you should with the kind of storytelling setups that the source material has well and it's it's as far as the western feel of cowboy bebop goes um issp stations in places that aren't metropolitan and huge like some of the places closer to jupiter uh are are going to be like 
sheriff outposts at any Wild West town. Mm-hmm. We see it. We see it a couple times throughout the series. So you've seen one ISSP station. You've seen them all essentially. Yeah. Then we get to the themes. Collecting bounties is certainly a necessity for a bounty hunter, but Spike and the rest of the crew often give up collecting the millions of Wulong they are due. In fact, a bounty always turns out to be much more than just a face on a poster. Their tragic stories are revealed before the eyes of our protagonists, who then find themselves having to make moral choices based on what they have discovered. In this game, therefore, a bounty is both someone to hunt down and an excuse to tell a story. In this, the narrator is helped by a cluster that, together with the session cluster, allows him to trace what the characters have discovered, what the media say about the bounty, and finally, what choice they will face. I really like this because, uh, like, just these two setups alone, um, a lot of people are going to be coming with the, coming to this with the idea of possibly playing the Bebop cl- crew in mind, which you totally could do. But this also means that you don't have to play the Bebop crew in any of the stories you've already seen in the in the show or in the movie um this 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 is a more a sandbox than it is uh you know a narration but this also means you can play other bounty hunter crews and hell you could choose to ignore the moralization to be a successful bounty hunter crew and actually have beef and bell peppers with beef <laughs> Anyway, next we go into foundations. First one is, money is never enough, but it's never a problem. Cowboy Bebop's characters can't afford to sit idle on their ship, but despite always seeming to be broke, they never have a problem paying gate tolls, extending a bribe to an informant, or finding the right costume to go undercover at a party. What's more, some of them happen to give up easy money as a matter of principle. Yeah, um, but again, all this tells us is maybe sometimes you'll choose to do the moralization, and maybe sometimes you'll just be like, fuck this, I want to get paid. Mm-hmm. So the, the second foundation is the past will come back to haunt you. Characters will get to explore memories, important moments from their past they haven't resolved yet, and that they will have to face in the course of a story. Facing a memory and coming to terms with it will make the characters ready to bear the consequences of their actions, and will reveal sides of them that until then had remained hidden. Well... (laughs) I I assume... We don't, if I remember correctly, we don't see many other bounty hunters throughout Cowboy Bebop. It's really only the Bebop crew we see. Um, But I imagine that with the way they're treated, uh, bounty hunter is not a profession you choose out the gate. It's not something that at the end of your education you go, I'm going to go be a bounty hunter. No, it's it's more of a profession of last resort. And it's a profession for people who want to hide or want to uh, escape from something. Mm-hmm. E- even Ed was technically escaping something, but she she wasn't escaping and never growing, never facing it. She was escaping to discover and eventually learn from it, which is why she's the only person from the Bebop crew who's happy at the end. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Well, her and I. (laughs) And the third foundation is death is always dramatic, never accidental. The death of characters and sidekicks is never a random and gratuitous event. If the moment is not dramatic, there's no point in staging the death of a character. Although death is an event relegated to the most dramatic moments, the characters will not have an easy life and will have to face the heavy consequences of their actions. 
The best way for a character to exit history is to have definitively come to terms with their past. I'm probably fine with this because I've already I've already mentioned that I've never been a fan of um what I of what's been called fantasy fucking Vietnam. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I read this section, and I... Because because this game is so contextualized around Cowboy Bebop, you're going to make the comparisons to the, to the crew. Um, and spoilers for <laughs> 23-year-old anime. Or longer. Spike dies! Oh my god! <laughs> I still hear the song blue in my head whenever I think about that. And fuck, is it harmful? But whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, he's the he's the only person to face down his past fully, but it's not in a healthy way. He doesn't he doesn't overcome it. Uh, he 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 gets stuck in it. He uh, as he as he told Faye very near the beginning of the series uh one of his eyes uh you know sees current day but the other eye seems to always replay his, the past and he doesn't know whether he's in a dream or not um and so if if the dramatic moment is <clears throat> your past dragged you back in aka finding julia and then the one tide of the past you actually liked is killed. The only thing you have left is to go after the other tide of the past you have and kill it yourself. Which is what Spike did. Mm. Which is why both Vicious and Spike die. God, that's... The, mm -hmm. it, it, with the way this is set up, this just aims for the game to be depressing as fuck. Yeah. Uh, um... We do ha we it there is there is a segment on sa on safety techniques which if I'm be which if I'm being honest I am I'm going to be skimming over because I've already made I've already made all my all my points clear on my attitude towards uh, towards safety tools Uh I'm not go I'm not going to throw a game out just because it has that just because it has the discussion about it but I am not, but I am not interested in dr in dredging that discussion up. Yeah, it, and honestly the what I'm reading here these safety techniques are it's more of a um the group needs to discuss and have consideration for what they will want to achieve. It, rather than a a hard, don't trigger your people sort of. We're not um, de we're not dealing with X card stuff here. Yeah, yeah. This is a. I feel that for people like you and me, this is kind of a common sense thing that we. That we unconsciously or subconsciously do with our groups in any game we're we're leading. Mm -hmm. Um. And. Honestly, I uh, I like that it's here maybe just to help newer storytellers, newer narrator narrators, newer GMs. Yeah. There's no reason there's no reason to make it into a gimmick, but moving, Exactly. Moving right along, we'll go right into Bounty Hunters. The first thing you need to do to play the game is to create your own Bounty Hunter, but in this quick start you'll find pre-generated characters directly from the Bebop crew. In the complete game, you'll find a guided walkthrough that, followed step by step, will help you familiarize yourself with some of the game's concepts during creation. Although you can create or choose your own bounty hunter, we suggest you follow the crew creation path together, exchanging ideas and comparing notes with each other. I know why that last part is there. Your crew needs to be coherent. Given my experiences with cer with certain adventuring parties that were made in isolation, <laughs> understandable. So then we get to the glossary, which goes over what a bounty is, uh, which we can we kind of already covered. <laughs> um, character. 
go ahead. I was just going to say there are some there are some terms here that I I don't think we need to cover in full, but there are interesting notes on some of these. Mm -hmm. um, character growth, because the bounty hunter will be able to acquire new traits in specifically constructed sessions to explore his past, revealing new aspects of his personality or exposing secrets and abilities that he had not yet showed off. Oh, then we have consequences. Unexpected negative results in a test. During a test, when these stakes are defined, the possible consequences are also outlined, i.e. the risk the bounty hunter is taking. That's cool. Oh. Okay. For those of you who, who like more generic gaming terms, uh, the test is your dice check. Um, the, the stakes are going to be your potential... Uh, outcomes, what what you're testing, what you're checking for, but listing what the actual consequences of a uh, of a fail or a fumble will be, that's actually really cool. Mm -hmm. See, so then we have cruise ship. The spaceship doubles as a home, garage, and headquarters for the bounty hunters. The most famous is undoubtedly the Bebop, but yours could become just as renowned and feared. Therefore, the choice of the name should be made together, regardless who the ship belongs to, and we recommend a reference to a song or musical genre. Playing to Cowboy Bebop's strengths. <laughs> um, and entertainment. What do you do to catch your breath between scenes? You get four rhythm points when you spend a scene relaxing, doing what you like. Like Jet Black looking over his bonsai trees, or, or Faye betting her newly earned Wulong probably losing he loses every time monk that's not probably uh, then we have groove unique ways to spend rhythm points can change with each session they're all in the things that you you have learned to survive and earn enough to keep you from drifting in space they can also be used as traits in a test name i'm skipping that we don't, I don't go ahead there was one thing I wanted to cover here. Like I said, we can skip it for most part, except for your name can be used as a trait in a test when putting your reputation and fame on the line. Mm -hmm. That's the important thing I wanted to mention about name. Yeah. Let's see, then memories. Like your origin, a memory represents something from your past that you still carry with you. Unlike your origin, however, it is something that is still unresolved and will come back to haunt you until you deal with it. A memory can be used as a trait in a test. Uh, then we have origin, a special trait that represents the place or time you come from. Everyone comes from somewhere and you are no exception. However, origin is not purely ge a geographical fact. It is your past, part of what has made you who you are today, for better or for worse. Therefore, your origin can be used as a trait in a test. See, then we have quality. What differentiates a ship from all others? It could relate to the ship's performance, armaments, or other unique features such as secret compartments, an ejectable cabin, or thermal sensors. It can be brought into play as traits. And then rhythm. Points that represent your stress and adrenaline. They can be spent to activate the groove, help other bounty hunters, or influence the result of a test. Sounds and like uh, your extra effort... Uh... Oh, it definitely is. Uh, then we have the CU. This trait represents your end, your last confrontation with the past. It will be the last trait you mark on your cluster when you have concluded your story. Um, session, which is kind of self-explanatory, though Session also has rhythm points, which indicates how far along in the resolution of the case the group is and how heated the situation becomes. Kind of like the clock mechanic that you see in Blades in the Dark. Mm -hmm. It um, it's really a, a matter of escalation, how close you are to the climax and re resolution of the session, as again as well as how how uh, how more how much more dangerous things seem to be getting. Mm -hmm. Let's see then ship. Every self-respecting bounty hunter has a vessel with which to pursue their bounties. 
Your ship speaks at, speaks of you as much as the rest of your cluster. The Swordfish 2, built for speed and with a plasma cannon, speaks of Spike as much as the Hammerhead, sturdy and armed with a harpoon and, and mechanical arms, speaks of Jet Black. Its name and qualities can be brought into play as traits. Then we have Test. When doing something dangerous, under pressure, or with a certain with an uncertain outcome, you'll have to roll the dice and hope for the desired result. Very often, you'll also run into consequences. Then trait. Traits are words that describe you, your knowledge, skills, and general abilities. Traits can be brought into play by explaining how they are helpful during tests. Each trait put into play during this way get, grants you one positive die to roll during the test. And tab. Part of a session indicating how close you are to catching the bounty. They also define how many positive dice will be turned into negative dice during a test. At the change of tabs, the storyteller will always introduce a plot twist that turns the tables. Tabs points are spent whenever bounty hunters make a successful test, and more points might be spent when a test gets more successes than necessary. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Then we get into the rules. The story you will tell is fed by tests, moments in play, oh, sorry, of play, in which a bounty hunter faces a risk that will generate new narrative opportunities, positive effects, and interesting consequences. These moments of play could resolve single actions or entire scenes, depending on what you want to tell. Still, in any case, they are important moments of the narrative, quick to solve, and able to generate opportunities for the player to advance the story and explore the motives and choices of the characters. Tests represent situations whose outcome is not a foregone conclusion, and the risk to which the bounty hunter is exposed may be more or less severe depending on the circumstances. You will need some six-sided dice of two different colors to play. Then we get to setting the stakes. When a bounty hunter wants to achieve something that presents risks, the storyteller will ask the player to attempt a test. A test might re resolve a specific action, such as getting someone to talk and revealing a secret, or have a broader effect, such as taking on the whole group of henchmen. All tests ha always have an uncertain outcome. There is no point in attempting a test just to drive a car in regular Mars traffic. That depends on the city, if you ask me. <laughs> oh, and some kind of possible unexpected negative consequences... There's no point in attempting a test that presents no no risk and where the most that can happen is that nothing happens. In this phase, the player clarifies the stakes, the result being sought, and the storyteller lists the possible consequences, the risk the bounty hunter is taking. And how, how appropriate that we talk about consequences next in the first image is Spike being bandaged up again. I mean... We could always say that Spike's stakes are he loves a woman who can kick his ass, <laughs> and the consequences are that picture. Yeah. Oh. See, then we have defining consequences. Once the player has clarified the stakes, the storyteller de defines what consequences the test might have. The player may also suggest interesting consequences for the test they are about to take, but it's the storyteller who will decide the consequences will ultimately be. Defining consequences first is helpful to allow the player to choose whether to spend rhythm points to use groove or to use memories to postpone the consequences at the end of the scene. Storytellers should also keep an eye on which tab, i.e. which section of the session, the bounty hunters are in, making consequences more and more incisive as the session progresses. Getting a consequence will not be the same if you are just looking for clues on a bounty or if you are facing them during a final confrontation. Making consequences explicit helps the storyteller to better describe the scene and allows the player to decide how to spend their rhythm points to limit the consequences. So, instead instead of doing some sort of... I think, I think one thing that is that some people are going to have to get used to with a game like this is it isn't a I roll to do X. 
It's, yeah. I want to. I want to try doing X. The GM was like, "Okay, but okay, but if you do, if if you if you fail at X, Y is going to happen." Yeah. If you if you do X, or if you try to do X, Y could happen if you're not careful. Is basically how how it works. Um, it's also a very streamlined uh, approach. Mm-hmm. It's it, not every action is going to even have you roll. A player could say, well, I want to do X, and the narrator looks at the situation and goes, okay, you do X, because there's there's no risk, and there, or there's, or like it said, there's no consequence. The worst that can happen is that nothing happens. Well, then, between nothing happening and something happening, something fucking happens. Also uh, means that we don't have to deal with people checking for traps every five feet. Yeah, that would be fucking ludicrous in Bebop. Um, I'd well, also it's, note that it's, it's, lud- it's ludicrous in fantasy gaming. Yes, although that paranoia has been beaten into some people like they were the redheaded stepchild of certain game masters. Um, <clears throat> I think the other thing that I really like about this, due to its streamline, this is a, a very crunch light game that I can see so far. Very it, crunch light. It, it, it very much is. I know some people turn up their heads about about the idea of crunch uh, crunch light being 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 not pr- being not proper, and there are certain crunch light games that I do, that I that I certainly don't respect, namely namely a lot of the really bad story games that I sometimes find on itch. We, but, we don't talk about itch not anymore. <laughs> but the but um. There is nothing ro- there is nothing wrong with rules light just because of the fact that it doesn't have some of the some of the aspects that you're more familiar with doesn't mean it doesn't make it bad. Oh. Yeah. But then then we get to building the bounty hunter pool. Once the stakes and consequences have been described, the player creates a pool by adding a positive die for each trait they bring into play in a viable way for the test. Each keyword written in a hex of the cluster is, in effect, a trait potentially valid during a test. Name, memories, ship, etc. It is up to the player to justify the its usefulness when they put it into play. There is no limit to the number of traits that can be brought into play during a test by a bounty hunter. No limit other than the amount of hexes on the actual page, mm-hmm. I think. Yeah. Then we have the difficulty of a test. Each test has a difficulty score ranging from 1 to 4. The storyteller never attempts a test. It is always the players who react to the dangers, although the storyteller may still have a bounty do some damage if the bounty hunters ignore them, forcing the bounty hunters to attempt tests to defend themselves. The difficulty corresponds to how many successes you need to achieve during a test to get the stakes. Then we have deciding the difficulty of a test. When bounty hunters are not directly facing a threat, but are nevertheless in dangerous situations that may have unforeseen consequences, the test will still have difficulty. The difficulty scale ranges start from zero, and I see a bit of a typo there. Remembering where you saw the person in front of you, up to four, facing Mad Pierrot. The difficulty cannot go beyond four. We also have a definitive uh, scale for difficulty and a definitive cap. Mm-hmm. That's pretty nice. I would consider facing Mad Piero or, well, literally all of Knocking on Heaven's Door um, as a four. Mm-hmm. Uh, then we have building the test pool. Depending on which tab the bounty hunter is on, some positive dice will be turned into negative dice, so you will need six sided dice of two different colors to play. Only one die will be transformed in the first tab, two in the second, three in the third, and four in the last one. If there are not enough positive dice to turn to negative dice, the bounty hunter simply rolls the negative dice they have available at the time. The pool will then be made up of a variable number of d6. Although a bounty hunter may not have enough traits to overcome the difficulty of a test. In that case, the player can decide to forego the test, or they can choose to spend six rhythm points to achieve a success with consequences anyways. It's an expensive success with consequences. Mm-hmm. 
from what we've seen, you only get four rhythm points when doing something re relaxing that, that's specific to your character. Because as they used with their advance, uh, their their examples, Jet uh, tending to his bonsai and Fay spending money, uh, spending money for gambling. Those are two different things, and I'm sure Jet spending money gambling would be nothing but an anxiety attack to him, and Faye trying to shape bonsai, she would be bored to tears. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Then we have helping a bounty hunter. A bounty hunter may help another bounty hunter during a test by spending rhythm points for each positive die they want to add. Helping means doing something in the scene that can be a game changer. Laying down cover fire, creating a distraction, saying a few words of comfort. Sometimes even the smallest gesture can have a significant impact. When a bounty hunter is helped, the storyteller may keep one more negative die than the player. Several bounty hunters can help a companion during a test, adding more dice. And then we get to then we get to the brass tacks, successes and failures. Once the dice have been rolled, the player must decide how many dice to keep, knowing that the storyteller may hold a number of dice equal to the negative dice they will keep. A positive die that scores a 4, 5, or 6 is a success without consequences. A positive die that scores a 1, 2, or 3 simply fails. A negative die that scores a 4, 5, or 6 is a success with consequences. A negative die that scores a 1, 2, or 3 may become a consequence if the storyteller keeps it. The storyteller can then choose how many negative dice to keep to add consequences to the test up to a number of the negative dice held by the player. The player may then choose to keep fewer dice than they need to pass the test if they want to try and limit the consequences that the storyteller can bring into play. The player may also keep more successes than are required to further improve the stakes he has achieved and advance the tab progression even more. That's interesting that you can choose to fail the roll. Fewer dice than you need to pass the test. Mm -hmm. If they want to limit the consequences that the storyteller can bring into play. That's that's interesting. I But wouldn't outright failing the test mean you get consequences anyway? You'd just get... Huh... So if you choose not if you choose to keep like one negative die, say one success with consequences, you'll still fail the the test, but that means there's only one consequence that the the storyteller can throw. That's interesting. I'm not sure how that'll work. I'd have to play it to see how it works. Then we go with after the test. If the player does not have enough successes, the storyteller may ask the player if he wants to wager one of his traits on a gamble. If the player succeeds, this is added to the successes scored during the quest. But if the negative die has a consequence, the trait is lost for the whole session and cannot be used as a d6 during other tests. If after a, do if after a dodge there are no more successes to complete the test, the trait can be rolled again until the trait is lost or the player decides to retire. Essentially, a gamble is a le is a last ditch is a last ditch attempt that can be used, and you'll lose and you'll lose it um, at least for a, a session uh, as something to add to later rolls if it's a negative die with a consequence. Mm -hmm. Then we have recovering rhythm points. Each bounty hunter can regain four rhythm points when they play out a scene describing a moment of relaxation and how they give in to their favorite habits. Giving into your habit doesn't necessarily mean you've committed a criminal act. It could simply mean escaping your duties for a few hours by tending to a small bonsai garden or lounging on the ship's sofa after gorging on the least expensive lobster in the fridge, making sure it hasn't <laughs> become an aggressively deadly organism. <laughs> Remember, folks, don't leave things in the fridge. I also, I also love how with toys in the attic, they ne they 
We never outright saw what happened to that Ganymede rock lobster. No, we didn't. But uh, we certainly know that with everything else, it was solved by Ed. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see, rhythm points are also regained in full at the start of a new session. Then we have tabs and rhythm points. Each session has its own rhythm points bar that indicates how close bounty hunters are to solving their problems and catching the bounty, but that's not all. A session's rhythm points are divided into four sections called tabs, which are three, two, one, and let's jam. <laughs> but is it time to get everybody and their stuff together? <laughs> When the session is in one of the first three tabs, the number corresponds to the number of points needed to help someone. In the Let's Jam tab, it still costs one rhythm point to help, but you can also share your rhythm points with the bounty hunter you are helping. And then we ha and we have something that I the only other person I can think of who's who does this with any degree of regularity is Wade's stuff with the fragged games. Mm -hmm. And that is putting a one-page summary that is perfectly set up for you to um, for you to print for you to print off on its own. Mm -hmm. A float, this little flowchart. Yep, I love it. Let's see, you set the stakes, then set the consequences. Count your traits. Each trait is a d6 in the pool. Set the difficulty. Exchange positive dice for negative ones. Oh, potentially get help, roll all the dice, choose what to keep. The the story the storyteller can keep this can keep the same number of dice. Unless you get help. Remember it said they can keep one more negative die than you. Mm -hmm. uh, those helping spend rhythm points and add one positive die, the storyteller keeps one more die. Yep. So this this is an interesting risk reward because the, because while you can well you can certainly add more well you can certainly add more di add more die um to the, to the ones that you keep the more that the more that you add which means the more co the more successes that you could get the more the more the storyteller could could um potentially screw that over well and of course that's also set by the tabs if you're still on the first tab they're only be able to change one of your positive dice to negative mm -hmm. i think i think it's i think there's the implication that when you're at when you're putting traits together each trait counts as a positive die mm -hmm. oh I don't think that was outright said, but I think, but that seems to be the implication. Um. It, so, building the test pool. Um. The, the. Uh, it was under I, building the bounty hunter pool specifically. Uh, positive D six for each trait they bring into play in a valuable way for the test. So when it says count your traits, I think it means count the traits that apply. Yep. And then for the gamble, you put a trait into play. The storyteller rolls 1d6. One D, one D if it succeeds, great. If it fails, the trait is lost for the session. Mm-hmm. I think it's a way to try to try and nudge a win in if you're will if you're willing to put in extra risk and the this whole uh, this is very much in keeping with the hexis system. In not the end the game beats you not the end beat you over the head quite a bit with how this is a game where your characters are going to be taking risks. Mhm. Mm uh -huh. <laughs> and then we get to Big Shot. Each bounty has a Big Shot groove. 
Punch and Judy will tell the will tell what the criminal the players are following can do better than anyone else. Whatever it is, the bounty can do it perfectly. Can do it perfectly, cornering the bounty hunters at the worst possible moment. A bomb that's always ready to explode. Meaningful political connections that will force the bounty hunters to loosen their grip, or an accident that has that has made someone immortal are all grooves that will remain true until the session reaches the Let's Jam <laughs> tab. <laughs> an accident that made somebody immortal. I can't imagine which person they're referencing from the show there. Alexa, play the Rolling Stones. <laughs> Allow me to introduce myself. I'm a man of wealth and taste. Indeed. But after that, the bounty can no longer rely on their own big shot grooves to get them out of trouble. And the bounty hunter can finally get rich, at least until the next session. I, th I think this is a good way to make it so that... Um, a bounty does a bounty doesn't get caught until the until the final act. Mm -hmm. And as an aside, the the way the way that the tab system works, that is, you can pr you can pretty much slot in the Kisho Ten Ketsu, um, format within that setup. Mm -hmm. Which, for those who don't know, is basically a four act structure that's you that's used that for a lot of people will most will mostly know it from its use in four coma. But it's it it gets as it gets about as much use as the three act structure that a lot of us are familiar with. Mm hmm. Oh, Let's see. Then we have narrative authority. The storyteller can stage new opponents and obstacles. Ask your players for details about a location or event that the storyteller has staged. Spend consequences to complicate the scene. Require a bounty hunter to spend their rhythm to obtain something particular without attempting a test. Ask a bounty hunter to attempt a test. The player can decide how their bounty hunter acts, decide which traits get put into play, decide which grooves to use, suggest details of places and characters staged by the storyteller, Spend rhythm points to help others. Spend rhythm points to get success with consequences. Suggest the storyteller how to spend the consequences. Suggest interesting solutions to problems. And gamble a trait to get more successes without consequences. Mm hmm. Let's see, then we get to playing. To play Cowboy Bebop, you simply need to be inspired by the style of its episodes. So it is no coincidence that the episodes of the animated series are called Sessions. The term is inspired by jazz culture and describes when musicians would come together to give a musical performance without anything preordained, usually improvising on regular chordal grids and themes. Each session tells an exciting story that emerges naturally from the input of all the players. A good session is short, rhythmic, and intense. If it has character and never dwells too much on a single element, Above all, each session is a choral work, in which each instrument finds its space, sometimes claiming it and sometimes stepping aside. As in an actual jazz session, listening to each other is essential. In this section, you'll find you'll find what you need to improvise interesting, well rhythmic episodes, enriched by the imagination of whoever is playing. In addition, you'll find several tips and examples to help you play a bounty hunter and facilitate the story in the style of the original work. Opening with, it's all about rhythm. The session's rhythm points are divided into the four tabs. Will guide you. Will guide you in keeping the session interesting, well rhythmized, and exploring each scene in depth, never letting it go dull. When one of the tabs is over, the storyteller will insert a twist that will push the plot toward the showdown, or even catapult the bounty hunters into a new situation to face. You should not look at the tabs as rigid and independent phases. It's simply that when a tab ends, the whole group knows that it's time to shake things up. Depending on what is happening, this could mean disrupting it by moving on to something else, or simply making it more interesting by inserting an unexpected element. You can also use tabs as a guideline to develop the session's plot. In the first tab, make sure you introduce the central theme 
and set it as unfold as events unfold in the following two tabs, possibly by exploring different situations. Finally, close in style during the Let's Jam tab. So the first one is three. In this tab, bring out the theme and tone of the session. Quite often, Cowboy Bebop sessions begin by showing a scene from the life of, a bo of the bounty hunter. This could be the end of a job that has been completed, a slice of everyday life, or one of the many quiet moments between jobs in which bounty hunters pass the time. If you're playing a bounty hunter, you're probably looking forward to the opportunity to get on the trail of a bounty, or at least find something to help you out of your rut. If you're facilitating, this is the stage to, in to insert a stimulus, narrate a off-screen scene, or describe an episode of Big Shot to put the bounty hunters in touch with something interesting to interact with and investigate. Or if you're Ed, you just tell them where the next bounty is, because Ed can do that for some reason. Yeah. Remember to leave some clues, such as the last place the bounty was spotted, their trademark, or even a tip to what their next, next misdeed will be. In this phase, helping each other costs three rhythm points. Bounty hunters can do this, but it is far more natural for them to act independently or use their grooves to move the session along and move on to the subsequent phases. And we have two examples given, one from Hard Luck Woman, the other from Boogie Woogie Feng Shui. <laughs> uh, it's essentially the opening scenes from either of these episodes. Yeah. For anyone who's watched it, you know what we're talking about. And it's funny that we we bring up all the jokes about bell peppers and beef, and the image they use for the three section is the converse, is the briefing regarding Asimov Solonson. The very first episode mm. where they talk about bell peppers with beef without beef. And the sole reason they don't have they don't have any beef is because of all the shit that <laughs> that Spike had gotten himself into. <laughs> Uh, then we get to the two. In this tab, you're getting into the swing of things. You've defined the fe you've defined the field and opened the dances, and now it's time to beat the trails available to the bounty hunters. In this tab, the investigation begins to reveal the true extent of the situation the players are experiencing. How serious is the breakdown of the ship? How big is the debt that one of the people involved in the story has to pay? Who is really involved in the affair? Questions and dialogues can inter can alternate with action phases, in which it is not granted that the bounty hunters are all acting together. In this phase, essential information and the first elements of the background are revealed, but uncovered obstacles are often revealed too. In this phase, helping each other costs two rhythm points. Collaborating and helping each other become more straightforward, but the personal initiative is still very favorable, and it continues with the examples of Hard Luck Woman and Boogie Woogie Feng Shui. This will be a pattern, I think. Mm -hmm. Then we get to one. The session is nearing its conclusion. Now things are getting serious, and the stakes are raised and clear. The bounty hunter's level of involvement is high, and they know that one way or another the showdown is approaching. This tab should guide the bounty hunters towards the climax of the story, often revealing the motives of the characters involved or the pieces of the puzzle that are useful to really understand what is happening in the story. This phase is also useful to increase the level of involvement of the bounty hunters, who have gone deep enough to want to settle the score once and for all. If there are insurmountable obstacles or unresolved elements, they are addressed overcome or cease to be relevant, leading the bounty hunters to experience the final part of the session. In this tab, help costs one rhythm point. As a result, the bounty hunters are more likely to act in concert together and help each other. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we get to the final stage, Let's Jam. This session is nearing its conclusion. The story is reaching its climax, and the stakes are as high as they can be. The bounty hunter's level of involvement is at an all-time high because during the session they found their motives for wanting to close the books. In this last tab, the tension reaches its top. The motives of the main characters in the story are revealed, 
revealing to the bounty hunters the human face behind the bounty or the case they are investigating. The bounty hunters may be faced with a moral choice, realizing that things are not were not as simple as they seemed. In other cases, adrenaline-fueled action will lead the session to its outcome. At the end of this tab, describe the bounty hunters' return to normalcy and, if you wish, how they have internalized the experiences they have just had. In this tab, helping each other costs one rhythm point, but they can also share the cost with the hunter they are helping, if they want to spend more if they want to spend more more than one point. Moreover, all consequences of the test are serious. What is written in the big shot space of the bounty stops being true. The Let's Jam tab is the true revelation and resolution phase of the session. Mm -hmm. And then it ends with the what would be considered Let's Jam for Hard Luck Woman and Boogie Woogie Feng Shui. Mm-hmm. Let's see, and then we have the elements of a good session. Rhythm. A good session is short, dynamic, and intense. It has character and never dwells too much on a single situation. The storyteller should never be afraid to insert twists and turns between tabs, whether the bounty hunters are calm and safe or in the middle of the action. Harmony. Each session is a choral work, with each instrument finding its own space, sometimes claiming it and sometimes stepping aside. As in an actual jazz session, listening to each other is essential. Identity. At the beginning of the session, agree on a good title to serve as an everyday basis for telling the story. You don't need to already know all the details of what that will mean. You'll find out as you go along. A story to tell. Whether it's the past of a bounty hunter or the story of a bounty, finding out the background of a seemingly simple story is essential to play an exciting session. A moral choice. Everyone has reasons for doing what they do. Truly evil villains are few. Often bounties have their reasons for doing what they did and the and beliefs that drive them. The bounty hunters will have to choose what to do when they discover them. Then we have interpreting tips. The bounty hunters are the protagonists of the story but they are also the eyes through which the stories of the bounties are told. Without them, no one would discover the stories behind the ISSP posters. The storyteller's job is to, keep pa is to keep the pace of the session crisp, but the actual content is all up to you. When playing a bounty hunter, never say no to a bounty. A few wulongs always come in handy, even if it's a lucky time, you have to strike while the iron is hot. Um... I'd like to point out that luck is a very capricious affair. As evidenced by the fact that Faye cannot win at gambling. Mm -hmm. Well, not without cheating. <laughs> Learn your real lessons. Whether you're a servant of justice or a profiteer, you have a personality and know what you think is right or wrong. Take the initiative and be willing to take risks. Bounties do not catch themselves and will not go easy on you. You hear th you hear that, journalists? No easy mode. <laughs> no simpy. Offer solutions. A bounty hunter always has an ace up their sleeve. A friend, a resource. If you come up with a way to deal with a situation or solve a problem during a session, do it. A friend, a resource, a weird Indian guy you continue to uh, visit by the banks of a river. Three old guys who happen to show up every every session. <laughs> Be ready to face your past. Something push, pushed you into this uncomfortable and reckless life. Know that it will come back to haunt you. Use grooves and help other bounty hunters. Your grooves are a great way to liven up the session and create breakthrough moments. Keep an eye on them. And then narrating tips. Good news. Narrating in, in Cowboy Bebop is easy. You heard call right. Call bullshit. It's easy. I call you bullshit. <laughs> you simply need a good impulse to get the story going, and then you have to just make sure... Oh, oh, typo. To keep the pace. 
The bounty hunters constantly give you ideas by taking the initiative and making tests. And the tab structure suggests when to spice things up. So you're saying that playing jazz is easy. Fuck off. Do I need to break out the black page again? No. That's only going to cause you and I unnecessary suffering. True. Anyway, it says when narrating, improvise or if you prepare, be flexible. Rhythm points will guide you to keep the session interesting. Give the bounty hunters a bounty to hunt. Remember that a bounty is a person. They have their character and reasons for doing what they do. Help the bounty hunters keep a good pace. Bounty hunters may rightly get carried away with the game's flow. This is where you come in to be ready to provide stimulation, soak clues, and ask questions. Insert a twist. Never be afraid to insert a twist when the Bounty Hunter's collective achievements complete a tab. Don't be afraid to go hard. Consequences are meant to add an element of action and sometimes drama to sessions. It's often a game changer. The ensuing investigations and action may reveal things aren't what they first seemed. And then the, the, then the next few pages are pre-gen... Characters, ships, and bounty. So we actually get to see what the character sheet proper looks like. And while there's a few more hexes than it, than in some of the other in some of the other um, hexes material that I that I have in my library, this is the hexes system p through and through with this setup. One of the things that it that it kind of that it will bring up is the fact that it. Is not involved. It is not interested in num in um, number based stats, but rather in tags. Mm hmm. And I think you can very clearly see that with the with the way the character sheet is set up. Yeah. Um. Now, I have a script on the back burner for not the end. But one of the things I really liked with not the end is that unlike certain games, i.e., Fate. It actually gives it not the end actually gave good examples for what would count on the different types of traits. I am hoping that the Cowboy Bebop RPG does the same thing. I think they will. Um obviously because this is a play test they can't go that deep into it, but mm -hmm. we got granular. But we can get an idea of what good traits are just by looking at these pre-gens for the Bebop crew. Mm -hmm. um, we already talked about how name, origin, and memory are uh, core blocks of the character. You know, the name being whatever name you've chosen for them. The origin being where they come from and how it shaped them. Whether that's a place or, you know, an identity or an organization. And the memories are things they will eventually have to face again. Yeah. Now, as far as as far as how as far as the question of how important is it where um where hexes are placed, um, it's mechanically speaking, it's not that important. I'd adv I'd advise have I'd advise putting some together some bit of linkage just for the sake of your own sanity. Mm -hmm. Um, an example of this kind of thing would be the way the trait spread is working out on Jet's um, sheet. Yeah. Also, the groove thing feels very much like how um, classes or archetypes worked in Knights of the Round Academy, especially since you're going to eventually get two of them. Granted, Knights yeah. of the Round was, was more in de was more in-depth on certain things, but point still stands. I, and I think this is a, a good, uh, like, Groove was sort of covered in the glossary about what it is. It's some sort of trick or set of skills for survival that the bounty hunter has picked up. Mm -hmm. But, for example, using Jet again, the Groove they have as an example is Hound. When someone you are following has fled, spend, spend three rhythm points. 
you'll notice a detail that puts you on their trail without having to face a test. It essentially bypasses a test, which could be very useful in, say, tab one or tab let's go, uh, or let's say I'm, excuse me, <clears throat> um, to bypass a test that'll have a high number of potential consequences if uh, if you lose somebody in a chase or something. So then, then we have in then we have a a um, bit a bit of a f on the uh, on the session entry we have um a fa a a kind of uh, a kind of outline. Yep. Um, or in, certain things. Mm -hmm. In the now the session is um, cherry bomb that deals with teddy bear, i.e. Theodore Thompson. Yep. Uh, you know the one that gave us the other space cowboy. <laughs> is, and shows the difference between someone who is a bit of a dick and someone who is a full on dick. Yeah. But you go anyway it goes in in cow in the Cowboy Bebop TTRPG, you will collaborate to create a story and its elements. Like in an actual jam session, your ideas will all shape by working together. The starting note is the title you will choose. Remember it must be evocative. If you need ideas, remember that titles of Cowboy Bebop episodes are often those of famous musical pieces. In this case, we suggest the title Cherry Bomb. In this session, we'll feature some of the themes from one of the most dynamic episodes of the series. We'll take our cue from episode number 22, Cowboy Funk. To create a fast-paced and dynamic session, we'll focus on the antagonist, the bomber Theodore Teddy Bear Thompson, taking some nar narrative liberties to, to adapt the events to our play. Bear in mind that when you create your sessions starring your unreleased characters, you can always take cues from the characters you've seen in the series and narrative twists to create new adventures. <laughs> so for, first we have Attack, which is suggested on the 3 tab. The player leading the session introduces a typical everyday moment on Bebop, asking the players playing the characters how they spend a relaxing moment. This is an opportunity to become familiar with the characters' traits and create arrangements between them. Each player can describe what their bounty hunter is doing and give free reign to the character's interpretation. Once this scene is over, it's the perfect time to bring into play one of Conway Bebop's central themes. Money is never enough, but it's never a problem. Whoever leads the session will inform other players that there's no more food on the Bebop, the ship is running out of fuel, and it needs a spare part. The best way to make some dough is to rely on Big Shot. Punch and Judy will introduce the most exciting bounty of the week. 500,000 Wulong hangs over the head of the Phantom Bomber Teddy Bear, wanted for, wanted for blowing up half an orbital station and other buildings of political interest. The program provides some initial information about the criminal, so the narrator will have to... Remember to give bounty hunters, perhaps deciding with them, some clues to start. Here are some possible clues. Reveal the last place where Teddy Bear struck. There are witnesses to his last attack. Who might have information about the bomber? The name of a particular club the f criminal used to frequent. Let's see, then we have investigation. The time has come to track, da to track down Teddy Bear. Where is he hiding? Where will his next what will his next target be? Based on the clues provided, it is up to the players to track down the criminal and work out his motive. It is now up to the bounty hunters to decide how to conduct their investigations. They will be helped in this task by their traits. Players choose how to make how to make char their characters act in a certain uh, act in order to of to obtain information. Based on this, they will have to face some tests. Then it gives an example of Ed wanting to find information from the from the patrons of the, of Teddy's favorite dive bar, obviously in pure Ed style. So the player playing them decides how the character wreaks havoc in the bar through a series of shenanigans that will allow them 
to obtain information even against the will of those present. In terms of rules, the player can bring into play the traits Curiosity killed the cat, but it didn't kill Ed. Free spirit and high IQ to win the stakes. And consequences. If the test results in success with consequences, these may complicate the scene. For example, Ed obtains the information, but is forced to flee the premises while her patrons chase after them furiously. Then consequences. If the test results in a failure with consequences, the action is unsuccessful and the situation becomes complicated. For example, Ed is thrown out of the club and a friend of Ted warns him that bounty hunters are on his trail, so it would be more difficult to track him down. If successful, the players may find that the bombs were, hi were high-powered microcharges and no one was injured. The chemical compound behind the bombs is produced in a factory that recently shut down by the, Ju by the Jupiter government. An inauguration is about to take place and will be attended by many important people. I, l I like these consequence examples. Um, considering this is tab three, the consequences should not be too drastic because we're still in the finding our bounty phase, mm -hmm. the unwrapping the mystery. And so these consequences... You know, a success with consequences. Ed is now running away from an angry mob, but she got the information she needed, and she'll get away. It's it's Ed. Mm -hmm. But you know, and then a consequence with failure. No one tells Ed anything. Kicks her out of the bar, and she's like, "Ah, oh, meanies!" As she goes away, and then you know, someone calls up Teddy and goes, "Yo, bounty hunters are after you." Mm -hmm. It's good to show that. Yeah. Next is follow the track which is suggested for the 2 tab. Once you've gathered enough information about Teddy's plans, you discover the, that the government is about to inaugurate a new building on Io, a moon of Jupiter. This is the perfect target for the criminal. Players must find a way to attend the inauguration of the building in order to intercept Teddy. How? It's up to them to decide how to go about it and come up with a cunning plan or a crazy stratagem. Why not or in both? the case of Spike, in in the case of Spike, just to dress up as a janitor. <laughs> it is clear that the situation is getting more eventful. Watch out for the unforeseen events that will complicate the hunt. For example, once the problem is get of getting the into the party is solved, Ein uses his smell the danger groove. The narrator tells them that something suspicious is happening in the kitchens. The cowboys catch up with Teddy as he is setting charges to blow up the building. He intends to take out one person in particular, the mayor of Jupiter. Once the bomber is nabbed with no with no little difficulty, the group discovers that it is not the real bomber, but his unabashed copycat, none other than an accomplice. Could, be, could this be a diversion? Where's the real one? All that remains is to find out before disaster strikes. Use all your skills and remember to help each other in rehearsals. Unity is strength. See, and then we have encounter. Then we have encounter, which is suggested for the one tab. The time has come. To, the time has come to come together and act in in synchrony. I think it's supposed to be synchronicity. Oh, synchrony is correct. Yeah, synchrony. All right. To stop Teddy at all costs, it will be easier to do this as a group, thanks to the fact that it now costs only one rhythm point to help each other in the trials. Teddy will try hard not to be sabotaged. The session will become extraordinarily dynamic and dangerous. Gunshots, crazy chases, chaos, and explosions await you. Then it gives the example. Confronting Teddy won't be easy. His singularity gives him the ability to have an explosive always ready. The narrator describes how the bomber holds the mayor of Jupiter hostage with a portable detonator in his hand. It's a standoff. Managing to disarm Teddy involves a series of difficult trials. Remember to help each other in one of the trials as Spike shoots Teddy's hand to remove the detonator. Jet immobilizes him with the Hammerhead's mechanical arm. Spike brings into play the traits of dangerous maneuvers and lightning reflexes. Jet helps him by adding a positive dice from the Hammerhead trait, Toe Hook. During the confrontation with the bomber, what moves Teddy is revealed. The mayor of Jupiter has shut down his chemical components factory. 
the Thompson Brothers Chemicals, ruining his career. Then Showdown on the Let's Jam tab. The Bounty Hunters finally managed to corner the Bomber. It's time to take full advantage of the Let's Jam tab. You have to reveal the backstory of the Bounty. Together, the whole group will narrate the actual motive of the antagonist. And then we get to, we go back to the example. Teddy reveals that his brother, desperate because of the intimate closure of the factory, died trying to avert its bankruptcy. So who's the real villain? The bomber or those who play with the lives of ordinary people for mere commercial interests? It will be up to the bounty hunters to decide what to do once the bitter truth is revealed. Let Teddy go free and give him a second chance or hand him over to law, to the law and, co and collect the bounty. You've, col you've completed your first session. Many more await. See you, Space Cowboy. That's the end of that quick start document. Yep. <laughs> and it could be argued that some of what we covered was, ad was adventure spoilers, but I think the statute's passed. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's over 20 years, so I'm pretty sure. Yeah, this was this is ba this is basically this is basically the Teddy Bomber storyline without Andy. Yep. And yeah. go ahead. <clears throat> First off, I'm not I'm I'm not done relishing in the fact that I that I was right all along when it came to that when it came to the mechanics of this system. I do think that some. I do think that for some people, that's going to take some getting used to. People who have a background in the most ubiquitous game are going to have a bit of a culture shock. Um, I realize that's a low bar, but it's going to happen. Oddly enough, I think I think that I think there there's veterans of two get two games in particular who I think are going to more naturally take to that take to the way this game works. Powered by the Apocalypse folks and Blades in the Dark folks. Yeah. Primarily, beca primarily because of the fact because of the fact that the whole uh, the whole consequences motif is present is present throughout. Um. That be that being said, I do. I think providing I think providing the reason why I wanted to go through that cherry bomb example is that it's a good representation of what the tab system is supposed to be. Yeah the 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 way everything escalates and comes to a head. Mm -hmm. It's a very good indication, a, a great outline of how a session is structured and what's expected of players and the storyteller. Mm -hmm. Like the, like I said, the consequences suggested it back in, in the three tab during the investigation, they're not fatal or damaging in any severe way. It's just, you lose an opportunity to get something safely, or you just lose the opportunity outright. Um, which is fantastic. I, I, I like that. That's, that is a good way to say, well, the stakes are rather low right now. There's still stakes. Stakes are always going to be there. But uh, as of right now, they are low enough that characters are going to be more inconvenienced than they're going to be harmed. Um, I think the harm would come... You'd start getting small amounts of harm during two-tab... But the the really risky stuff, and of course the stuff where the difficulty of of the checks tends to run high, are you know the one tab and the let's jam tab. That's the point where you could get at the end of the session spike wrapped in bandages. At the end of the session, uh, characters crying to themselves because of the the sheer mental torment they went through. Um, there's. Remember, people, not all damage in Cowboy Bebop is, is physical. And in fact, you are going to take more kicks to your to your uh, metaphorical heart, because I, I don't have one, 
he lied as simply as he breathed. Uh, the, the you're going to take these kicks, and you're going you're going to see in whether you watch the show or whether you play the game that not all consequences <laughs> show. Some consequences will be much deeper than on the surface. Mm-hmm. Let's just give the entire crew more PTSD, why don't we? Or poison them all until Ed eats the, the thing that was poisoning them all. <laughs> the fact that Ed just ate it while sleeping was the best part. Yeah, and um, I do hope, and I do hope that there's a few, a few more of these, um, re- these restyled ta- takes on certain episodes in the full book, because there, there's a few plot specific ones that I'd be really curious how the, how they'd interpret it in the in the, in this sense. Mm-hmm. And if it if it sounds like I want if it sounds like I want them to tackle one of the stories that Vicious was involved in, yes, yes I do. <laughs> Ballad of Fallen Angels might be a little bit hard to do, but Jupiter Jazz I think would be easier to handle. Jupiter Jazz you could definitely do, and you could still make it a single session. You could just split Jupiter Jazz uh, Part One into tabs three and two. And then sp- split part two into tabs one and let's jam. Um, I think part of uh, part of uh, of some of these episodes that you could pull inspiration from. Just look at the quote section on on any of the the wiki pages for episodes. There's there's some stuff you can pull. Mm-hmm. And hell, the, you know, give, given how um, given how we had discussions about about different space westerns, there's pl- there's plenty of there's plenty of um, storytelling motifs in the other the other two big space westerns of the of this era. That could, that are ju- they're just rife for stealing from to get session ideas. Um, oh, ones we covered in our very first episode of Geek Watch. Yeah. <laughs> and <sighs> of course, of course, of course, ju- just when it comes to just when it comes to westerns, there's pl- there's plenty of there's plenty of possibilities. I'm pretty sure. If, I'm pretty sure if someone wanted to, they could probably find a way to make a session out of Sukiyaki Western Django. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't know I if I'd. Movie. I don't know if I'd have people trying trying to do Japanese accents in that if I'm at that table. I'm not even going to try. Uh, there are things I can attempt, but I. I no, thank you. Oh. I might throw a, a Scottish one out there just to fuck with everybody, though. Maybe, but the key th- the key thing is that because of the fact that this that it's very clear this is built upon cues, there's enough there's enough wiggle room for people to fill in the blanks without it feeling like a swim damn it situation. Hmm. Ah. Oh. And I'd say this is also an opportunity to f- to fill in some of the blanks when it comes to the setting that the that the anime obviously wasn't able to. Mm-hmm. Um, I still haven't read I, I still haven't finished the Cowboy Bebop manga, but from what I understand, it's just a collection of standalone adventures. Yeah, um, which you know fits most of. Uh how cowboy bebop tends to work in the first place there is one anime in particular that i'm a, i'm of the opinion is rife for things to steal from to do a cowboy bebop game 
even if it even if it's a different anime. Mm -hmm. Um, Lupin the Third. Yeah, yeah. The this game actually lends itself really well to, uh, and specifically because it is built off of the the session system that Cowboy Bebop followed. It lends itself really well to an episodic, uh, non-linear, and technically you don't even have to connect them, uh, session structure. It's it's meant to be a collection of one-shots that, if you want to, you could make an arc out of. But this is something you could take to any LGS, sit down with some randos, teach them the rules real quick, and have a single session and be done. You you would never have to. This I think it would be a really good system. Even I I could see this even being used for beginners, monk. What about you? I would I would say yes. And the and the large reason that I'd say yes is because your get is because this is reinforcing the experience of pl of playing. Of do, of role playing of be of playing in character, without have it without having it being colored by optimization or or stat use or the like. Mm hmm. This this is I think a perfect system to introduce the role playing portion of the role playing game. Mm hmm. Because as as I've mentioned in the as I mentioned in the past. The more ubiquitous name, the more ubiquitous names. Well, some of the, well, some of them could arguably be go be good introductions. The problem is, is that if you if you train someone the wrong way, um, they're gonna they're gonna fall back on those habits. Yeah. Not to and not to bring up sport, not to bring up sports in something as as something as nerd at nerd related as this, but consider how some. Consider the idea of somebody ha developing bad habits as a collegiate athlete, and those habits aren't aren't being coached out of them mm -hmm. when they're in college. Then they get then they get drafted into the pro leagues, and they still have those habits, except ne except now it's in a worse support structure. Not only that, those bad habits once they're um, commutated over to the pro leagues become much more. Uh, much more exaggerated com in comparison to their other pro league uh, compatriots. Mm -hmm. A bad a bad habit that could be covered by the rest of your team and the league you were playing in because it's not as big an impact there suddenly becomes a very sore spot in a much larger uh, game. If I know some people might be thinking that I'm referencing certain names the Except the thing is, you could just list every I could just list every quarterback bust in the last twenty years, and I'd would and I wouldn't be wrong. <laughs> especially especially high especially high draft picks. There's actually a very high failure rate for top for top for top pick quarterbacks. But um, I actually. The the uh, the thing that gets me about this, other than the fact that it is introducing the role playing portion of role playing game, the rules are very easy to understand. You can t you you could hand this quick play document to most people who know how to play a game, not even TTRPG, but just play games in general, and they could they could understand how the rule structure. And game flow work, mm -hmm. and this isn't even the the full document. This isn't even the full game book. This right here just gives you the the bare essentials necessary to play the game, and that's it, the fact that they can distill it so easily uh, speaks volumes, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And. I don't know now. I don't know when the Kickstarter will be co will be coming out for it. All I know is that it'll be sometime in twenty twenty two. 
I have I have been trying to make to make my inroads to get to getting another interview on the matter. Um, it is up in the air whether or not I'll be able to do that. I'd like to I'd like to hold to because that because there's some interesting stories I'd like to I'd like to explore with the developers. But that's out but that's out of my hands. Either, either that being said, will I use this to rub it in to rub it in the face of people who were negative Nazis about this project? Absolutely. He already did. He's just going to continue. I'm going I'm going to keep doing it for as long for as long as I need to to make to get the message across. Honestly, I don't think many people in the monastery were good, were were in doubt of you, except for our erstwhile former compatriot and the few that agreed with him. Um, but I just like the fact that, for once, it's not my pettiness on display. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you already you already know that it, that my reputation for pettiness is legendary. Yes, that's why I have to match it. <laughs> but that is go that is going to do it for this emergency episode of Valley of the Judged. We will be we will be doing the one that we had scheduled on fr on Friday, covering something supers related. It's just that when when this thing when this thing dropped, I was like, we got to do a Valley on this. <laughs> I was I was in complete agreement. I I was like yes I Cowboy Bebop fuck yes especially since it's not Bop Flix. Mm -hmm. uh, no I'm not scarred. What are you talking about? I I don't plan to do it anytime soon, but I am planning on re on revisiting this concept and how we and how we might take elements from the from each episode of the series as well as as well as the movie and adapt them into this system. I would rather do I would rather do it when I have some more material though, which is why I'm not doing it anytime soon. Mm-hmm. I'd also like to have more than just you and me doing that because I know that there are many people in the monastery who are fans of Cowboy Bebop. Well, we can we'd probably we'd probably extend it to a few to a few other names, but I don't want a whole floodgate going on. I know. I'm just saying. As, as much as you and I do working in a duet concert, uh, uh, Monk, and how well we do, um, variety is the spice of life. Mm -hmm. I like having other people to bounce off of. Like Doku the other night. Fair, po fair point. But with all the... But with all that said, we'll be back in a couple in a couple days, and and um I and I hope you all look forward to when that to when that moment comes. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.